This presentation offers a scenario for which the accurate non-logo pressure gauge was used for AFC Championship game pre-game measurements and for which the halftime measured pressures of the Patriot and Colt footballs are explained. The scenario is significant because the Wells report enthusiastically argues that the non-logo gauge was more likely than not used for those measurements and this scenario is consistent with that hypothesis. The presentation of the scenario is organized with respect to significant errors in the wells and exponent reports. The ambient temperature of the air at field level is not known. It was likely significantly colder than the 48 degrees Fahrenheit measured 100 feet above the field. The temperature of the water that was absorbed into the football leather is also unknown. It is likely significantly colder than the ambient air temperature at field level. The exponent report argues that activity with a football does not change the pressure of a football, independent of temperature effects. Simple experiments show that this is not the case. When a football is overinflated and then the air is released until a desired pressure is released, achieved, the pressure continues to go down after the gauging for a demonstrated 30 minutes and a loss of 0.3 psi. For the two Patriot footballs that were overinflated and then deinflated to 12 point psi, their eventual pregame pressure was likely 12.2 psi. In this scenario, the Patriot footballs at halftime have a bimodal distribution of pressures and temperatures depending on whether they were played in the game and wet or not played and dry. In this scenario, all of the gauged Colt footballs were dry and not played. The temperature on the field was colder than estimated by the Wells and Exponent reports. The halftime temperature used by the Wells and Exponent reports was measured about 100 feet above the field at the top of the south scoreboard, the far scoreboard in the picture. The wind was blowing at 15 to 20 miles an hour from the south at the bottom from the bottom of the middle picture. The measured temperature was that of air that had not been over Gillette Stadium, air that was just starting to blow across the top of the stadium. The field tarp was expected to be removed an hour before the game. The field tarp insulated the turf under it. The days and nights before the game were cold, below freezing. Two days before the game, a horse in neighboring Rentham fell on the ice and could not get up. They did eventually get him up. One day before the game, three alpaca fell through the ice on a pond in Marblehead and needed to be rescued. They saved all three. The night before the game, someone posted a picture of nearby Lake Massapogue completely frozen over. I can't be sure the photo was actually taken that very evening. The days and nights before the game were cold and the ground and the stadium structures on game day were very cold. Nearby Norwood Airport logs all the temperatures day and night. For game day, the temperatures range from 15 to 53 degrees Fahrenheit. For the Saturday before, the temperatures ranged from 8 to 23 degrees Fahrenheit, below freezing all day. For the Friday before, the temperatures ranged from 15 to 37 degrees Fahrenheit. For the Thursday before, the temperatures ranged from 21 
to 28 degrees Fahrenheit. In the days before the game, the cold had an opportunity to work its way deep into the ground. On game day, Gillette Stadium was emerging from a multi-day below freezing cold spell. The stadium structure and artificial turf created a local temperature on the field that would be colder than that measured from atop the south scoreboard, particularly with a wind blowing from the south. The scenario requires the turf itself was 9 to 10 degrees colder than the air measured from atop the south scoreboard and that water on the field had a temperature of 38 degrees to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The wind chill temperature for 15 to 20 mile per hour winds and 48 degrees Fahrenheit is about 41 degrees Fahrenheit. The perceived temperatures at the top of the stadium were roughly equal to those perceived at field level without the wind. There does not seem to have been measurable rain during the first half of the game. Norwood Airport did not report any. The time is on the left in the red column. The rain or lack of it is described on the right in the red columns. The blue box highlights the duration of the first half. During the first half, the temperature of the water in the turf reflected the temperature of the turf, not the air above it. It was cold and roughly 38 degrees to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Broadcasters just described it as raining at the beginning of the game, but it appears to have been only misting. A cloud was sitting in Gillette Stadium. There are no images in broadcast of water dripping from clothes or helmets throughout the first half. The artificial turf is field turf revolution with a versatile drainage layer. The installation includes layers of rough and fine stone. The actual turf includes infill that is deposited amongst its fibers and it's composed of sand and rubber. The water that accumulated within the turf was condensate because of its temperature. For the Patriot footballs, no leather conditioner was applied during pregame preparation. They would have soaked up the cold water in the turf. The game play would have pushed water into the leather. The heavy rain during the second half would have warmed up the turf to the temperature of the rainwater. Exponent performed experiments and analysis that led them to conclude that gameplay with a football does not change the pressure of the football independent of temperature changes. The experiments and analysis appear to be flawed. They used a 650 pound force piston to attempt to change the pressure of a football. There were 1,000 assertions of force at one second intervals and no change in pressure. However, it appears that the piston was directly on top of the air valve of the football and that might have prevented release of air. They considered whether the volume of a football changes, but they measured the outside of the football. The volume of interest is the internal volume of the rubber bladder. That is a volume that is difficult to measure. The position of the internal seams of a football can change the interior volume. I ran an experiment in which a football is rolled under 210 pounds of weight for 16 minutes, 40 seconds. Afterwards, the football reached thermal equilibrium, 
thermal equilibrium relative to a control football. The football had lost 0.45 pounds per square inch in contradiction of the exponent conclusion. I don't know whether air was lost or the volume changed. For footballs that are put into play, some should be expected to lose pressure independent of temperature effects. As I described in the introduction, pumping up a football and then releasing air does not immediately establish a stable pressure. In the circumstances of my experiment or demonstration, I pumped up a footfall from about 6 psi to 14.55 psi and then released air pressure, released air until the pressure reading was 12.65 psi. Over the next half hour, the pressure declined to 12.35 psi at which point it appeared to be stable. I expect a football to lose pressure after it has been overinflated and then deinflated to a particular pressure. I, I specifically anticipate a drop of 0.3 psi. In this scenario, I consider the four Patriots footballs with the highest measured pressures and all four of the Colt footballs to have been dry and without playing time. For each team, four balls were not played during the first half. The dry Patriot footballs are numbers 1, 3, 6, and 7. I choose number 3 football to be one of the two footballs that was pumped up and then deinflated during pregame gauging and I attribute a pregame time pressure of 12.2 psi to the football at 71 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm using non-thermal variations to smooth out pressure and temperature variations in the Patriot footballs. By application of the ideal gas law in circumstances of constant volume, the temperatures of at, at, at the time of pressure measurement of the Patriot footballs at halftime are uh, ranged from 50 to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperatures of the cold footballs ranged from 55 to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. In this scenario, I consider the remaining seven Patriot footballs to have been played in the game and, significantly, and to be significantly wet with cold water. I assume that balls number five and number eight are the two balls that were measured at 12.6 psi before the game. I assume that ball number 10 is the all the ball that was pumped up and then deinflated, and I attribute an initial pressure of 12.2 of psi to the ball. I assume that balls number 4, 10, and 11 lost pressure during the game independent of temperature effects, respectively 0.15, 0.15, and 0.05 psi. In all of these circumstances, I'm using non-thermal pressure variations to smooth out the variations in Patriot football pressures and temperatures at halftime. The temperatures of the wet Patriot football range from 39 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit. The maximum pressure change due to temperature is 1.65 psi for ball number four for a temperature drop of 32.35 degrees Fahrenheit. In conclusion, I have presented a plausible scenario for use of the non-logo gauge before the game, an absence of pregame football tampering, and pressure variations in halftime pressure measurements that are due to temperature variations. At the time of halftime pressure measurement, the dry Patriot footballs ranged in temperature 
from 50 to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. And the dry foot, cold foot bulls ranged in temperature from 55 to 61 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperatures rise as time elapsed during halftime. At the time of halftime pressure measurement, the wet Patriot footballs ranged in temperature from 39 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit. These balls were much colder and like, likely much wetter than simulated by exponent and considered by Wells. The presented scenario is no less likely than any other specific scenario that is consistent with the known contemporaneous measurements. Thank you for viewing. Goodbye.